Terrific. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us on this Friday. Um, I appreciate your joining us for our fourth installment of Zoom in. in. I am pleased to spend time with Senator William Mo Cowan, class of 94, virtually today. Thank you, Mo, for being here. Thanks, Miel. Thanks for having me, inviting me. This will be fun. I'm going to share a bit about Mo's background first, and then I have some questions for him. So uh, he was born in Yadkinville, North Carolina. Did I say that right? You certainly um, did. No other way to say it, Miel. <laughs> perfect. Um, U.S. Senator William McCowan retired as president of Global Government Affairs and Policy and Developed Markets for General Electric Company. He's responsible for directing the company's government relations, public policy engagement in the United States and around the world. Mo also leads the Global Growth Organizational National Executive Teams in Europe and Canada. Mo previously served as Vice President, Litigation and Legal Policy for the company, overseeing litigation, enforcement proceedings, investigations, and compliance globally. Before joining GE, Mo held leadership roles as President and CEO from May 2016 to March 2017, Senior Vice President and COO from November 2013 to April 2016, and with ML Strategies, a leading government relations and consulting firm and the law firm Mintz, Levin, Cohn, Ferris, Glovsky, and Popio. Most, Mo also served as a fellow at the Harvard University Institute of Politics for the fall semester of 2013. On January 30th, 2013, Governor Deval Patrick appointed Mo to serve as interim United States Senator upon the resignation of John F. Kerry. During his Senate term, Mo served on the Senate Agriculture, uh, Commerce and Small Business Committees and co-chaired the Subcommittee on Nutrition, Specialty Crops, Food and Agricultural Research for the Commerce Committee. And Senator Cowan concluded his Senate service on July 16, 2013. Prior to his Senate appointment, Mo served Governor Patrick in a variety of leadership roles, including Chief Legal Counsel, Chief of Staff, Senior Advisor. As Chief of Staff, Mo directed strategic planning, investment and operations, including oversight of the state's multi-billion dollar annual budgeting process. As chief strategist and crisis manager to the governor, Mo advised on all domestic and international affairs, intergovernmental relations and gubernatorial appointments and administered all management and personnel functions within the governor's office. He's a graduate of my alma mater, Duke University and Northeastern University School of Law. And he holds honorary degrees from Georgetown, Newbury College and Bridgewater State University. He's a member of the US Association of Former Members of Congress. And he also serves on governance boards of uh, the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate, MGH and Eastern Bank Corporation. He's quite busy. So Mo, first of all, that's quite a background. Tell me how you and your family are surviving quarantine. Are you becoming, <laughs> are you becoming closer? Uh, thanks for the question, Miel, and thanks for the, the kind introduction. Hopefully we didn't lose too many viewers as you were rattling off uh, all that. Uh, look, this has been an interesting couple of months for us. Uh, so my wife, Stacy, who's also a Northeastern law grad, and I have been sheltering in place with our two boys, one who's a sophomore in high school, the other is a uh, rising seventh grader. Um, okay. been trying to, trying to get them to concentrate on virtual schooling. Um, I've been fairly sequestered within the sequestered environment inside the home office, uh, <laughs> spending most of my time on telephone calls or Zoom calls or Microsoft team calls. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting though, I, I think one of the things that uh, may come out of this for a lot of folks is uh, it is the work from home orders and things like that have brought families together. Uh, you know, we're just in the same space all the time. You know, I've probably, I've definitely eaten more meals with my family in the last couple of months than I probably have right. in, in many, many months. Um, and just yesterday I had the chance to go out in the backyard and do something I hadn't done in a long, long time with my boys, certainly in the middle of a work day, which is just toss around the football. Um, oh, I also realized, yeah, it's fun. I also realized my arm isn't what it used to be. So um, <laughs> that's, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been great. It's been great. Um, you know, so now if you were asking my sophomore in high school, I'm not sure he'd give you the same answer. I think he's, he, yeah. he may be getting a little too much dad time, but that's okay. I've been following your tweets on teen, uh, quarantine with a teenager because I also have a 16 year old. So I've been relating to those and 
when there's a sighting and you know every <laughs> once in a while they emerge for for meals but yeah i've been enjoying that but um i know it's well, nice as well so i'm thinking things are pretty good over at the Cowan household so that's me well, well i should take this time as a, an interest of full disclosure that my my tweeting about my teenage son does not necessarily uh comport to the reality of life of my teenage son he is he's a great kid and uh, yes and his, his mom frequently reminds me that he, I should stop making him my Twitter foil, but he is, uh, <laughs> uh, but he's not on Twitter right now. So he has no idea what, uh, what his old man is saying about him. So. Perfect. Um, so I'm going to take you way back. This is kind of a, this is just Miel wants to know this. When you were a young child in North Carolina, what what were you envisioning as your goals and dreams? Did you ever dream the U.S. Senate? Did you did you have governmental aspirations in some way? Were you president of your senior class? I just want to go back uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, here's a fact that I don't know many people actually know about me. You know, I've actually only run for office one time in my life, and that was in the eighth grade at Courtney Elementary School, <laughs> um, and. I ran for uh, student body president for uh, my eighth grade year. It was the first time we'd had an election because we, a team of which I was a member had actually created a student constitution. And nice. so I ran for president, actually ran the other candidates for two of my uh, close friends, uh, Tony and Kevin. Uh, I think they both <laughs> ran the campaign. And, uh, but I came out on top. Um, may or may not have something to do with my influence in drafting the constitution and sort of some might consider it a political coup, but I managed to, to manage to win the election. Um, but honestly, that was not an indicator or a portent of, of me, of some great political career. That was not my aspiration. I grew up in a very small town. Yakinville is about 3,000 people. Wow. It's a blue collar town. It's a, it's a rural community. Uh, farming was a dominant way of life. Um, uh, but I always sort of had a longing to see what else the world had to offer. So college for sure was going to be an avenue for me to explore the world and explore options. Uh, my parents were both blue collar workers. There were no lawyers in my, um, in my family. We had a few family members in the medical profession, uh, predominantly nursing and, yeah. and nursing aides. So medicine was something that was intriguing just because I found it to be fascinating and, and thought it could be complex and interesting. So when I was in high school or toward the end of high school, I actually thought that I might pursue a career in medicine. As a matter of fact, that was a, a factor in choosing the schools I applied to, including Duke, yeah. uh, where I actually, my original plan was to go to Duke and major in biomedical engineering and become an anesthesiologist. Huh. Uh, none of those was, things happened. <laughs> I was going to be a pediatrician, Mo. Yeah, so there we are. Um, yeah. two, two failed doctors, but look at us now. So, um, so that was it. You know, my... My parents, um, particularly my mother, who became a single parent uh, when I was 16 because we lost my father in a car accident, um, her mindset, her you know, dictate to us essentially was uh, not to allow ourselves to think of the limits on our future by the, our current circumstances. And so she really pushed us uh, towards pursuing academic success and appreciating that that was going to be or could be a gateway to many other opportunities, including many that she had no personal familiarity with, and frankly, some of which she'd been denied having grown up in the rural South during the Jim Crow era. Yep. Well, you did great with that. Um, so I'm going to ask you another question. It pertains to our undergraduate alma mater. We were speaking about mm -hmm. that briefly. Um, one we both love, but um, we're discussing lessons in leadership today, and I can't think of a better leader than Coach K. Um, what did you think of his bold decision not to play in the ACC tournament, which effectively changed the shape of the NCAA this year? Look, I think it's a tough decision. I, look, we are, these are unprecedented times, or at least in recent times, unprecedented recent times. Uh, you'd have to go well back maybe to the Spanish flu of 1918, you see something similar to this. And so look, I applaud all those in leadership positions who've had to make these tough decisions, right? I think health and safety are, uh, and should be the dominant considerations, both as we think about, as we reflect on what we did in the wake of the pandemic, and as we think about reopening. 
And as I, I said before, we got started on this call, you know, at GE, we, we actually have some factories and facilities that have remained open throughout this because they are essential to national security, healthcare, and things like that. Wow. But even, even in those environments, it's critically important to us that we make sure uh, that we're providing uh, as best we can the healthiest and safest environment for those critical team members who are doing that essential work. So for someone like Coach K to make that call, I'm sure he gave it tremendous thought and probably was concerned not just about his players, but all those who would have piled into the Greensboro Coliseum, I think it was in Greensboro this year, yeah. to, or, or Charlotte, um, being in close proximity. I mean, the, the challenge we all face right now is we don't know enough about this virus yet. And, uh, but it seems to be incredibly uh, contagious and spreads through close contact. And I think we just have to be, we have to accept that reality. We have to balance that reality in health and safety with our desire to reopen so that we don't have long-term economic damage. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I err on the side of health and safety. Let's make sure that we can, whatever we need to do, we're going to do it with those considerations in mind. So I applaud Coach Gay and I applaud the ACC and ultimately the NCAA and all the sports leagues who took those actions. Uh, yeah, you know. especially the early adopters, I feel like were yeah. really bold. Yeah, um, and look, Oh, well, I was just going to make I was just going to make the point in the same fashion that we made the early decisions to, you know, if you will, shut down and 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 take those preventive measures. We're also going to have to smartly think about reopening. Right. So um, it, it's 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 going to take uh, tremendous thought and effort. And, and uh, let's just be honest with ourselves. The world that we were familiar with in January and February of this year. We're not going back to that world. We're in a new world order now, and we're going to have to, our lives have been changed, the way we engage with each other, the way we conduct business, the way travel, all that's going to be changed, right? But it's an opportunity for us to change it smartly. True. So um, first, I want to say congratulations on being named to the power list by Boston Magazine, one of the top 100 most influential people in Boston. That's a big deal. Um, so clearly, uh, clearly they didn't clearly they didn't poll anyone in my house. So let's just <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, they must have polled others. But uh, congratulations on that. And Thank um, you. You, you touched on this a little bit already, but I'm going to dive in and say, um, how have you adapted to lead? You're in a, a high level leadership role during this public health crisis. How has your day to day changed? Well, obviously, the most obvious thing is you're not with your team, right? You're not um, with any members of your team. You're on their own. They're on their own. And so it creates challenges because, you know, the nature of our work uh, is if I'm with the team in D.C. in particular, you're walking down the hall, you're sort of you're talking, thinking, strategizing on the fly. You just pop in an office here and there. Less so for my colleagues outside the U.S. For, with whom uh, I, I work with quite a bit and have responsibility for, but even they, within their own offices, were doing the same thing. So look, the the the, the current circumstances impact connectivity, and connectivity or the absence of connectivity can impact the work that we do. So you have to uh, refocus and reframe connectivity. So my typical day is a lot like this conversation, right? On Zoom, Skype, Microsoft team calls uh, with my team, with our stakeholders, because you need to create as much of a semblance of that regular connectivity as possible. Communication is key right now, whether you're talking about the virus, um, how it's impacting people, how it's impacting our work environments, how we're thinking about reopening, how governments are reacting to this. There's a lot of questions. And part of the work that my team and I do is to try to answer those questions, gather information and provide our business leaders and our senior leaders information they need to make the best and smartest decisions they can. And then that has to cascade to those nearly 300,000 men and women who are GE, right? So communication is critical. So there's, a great, there's been a greater emphasis candidly, Neil, over the last couple of months in communication. I'm probably communicating more with my team now that's great. Uh, than I did previously, um, or I should say more scheduled, organized communication, right? Because, and even if I don't have anything profound to say, which is most days, right? Just, <laughs> just touching, uh, just reaching out, touching them just to see how they're doing, to, to yeah. remind them that, that we are connected, right? That our work 
depends on that connectivity collaboration. And so it's a more a concerted effort now, but it's yeah. more important that we make that effort now. Terrific. Yeah, I, it feels good to feel like you're part of something larger than just yourself in your living room and making sure that connect connectivity still happens is essential. Um, I don't know if this is true or not, but did you did you have offices in China and were you able to learn and adapt things from them on the early side because you had advance notice from those offices? <laughs> And could you speak uh, we, to that a bit? Sure, sure. Yeah, we do have operations in China. As a matter of fact, China is probably um, our largest non-U.S. market, actually. So all of our businesses are represented in China. We have a, a very good and, and strong uh, team in China uh, in all our businesses across the corporate function. So obviously, they were impacted early from this. Um, probably more than anything right now, Miel, we're looking at as China is on the, you know, seems to be on the other side of this right, right? We, we think yeah and we think we hope watching how that economy that restarts now it's, it's a different situation because uh, the nature of, of and the, the influence of government in china over um uh, over the population it's different than here in the states so there's not a one-to-one -one correlation obviously but we're paying close attention to see if there are uh, what the what the positive indicators are, you know, that we as a company, and then perhaps we as a country can think about, right? So we, but we're talking to policymakers around the globe, Miel, as they're starting to come out of this, you know, um, particularly right. in Europe, which is which is heavy hit, where we have significant operations. Uh, so we're in constant dialogue, both inside the U.S. and outside the U.S. about the impacts of what we're all experiencing and thinking about how do we smartly come out of this, right? Because we don't wanna do a huge rush yep. to just uh, to restart without some of these considerations for fear of uh, creating uh, uh, you know, or a worse dynamic than we're coming out of. Are you like reconfiguring offices and things at this point or not yet? Like, is that, are you? So those, those conversations candidly are underway. We have a robust internal process that involves multiple functions, much, multiple thought leaders, and it's gonna be site specific, honestly, right? So what, what we do in the Boston headquarters, perhaps in terms of reconfiguring the space or thinking about how we structure people's start times or maybe right. go to like a red or blue team model. Some folks here this week, other folks away. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't think you're going to, you can go, you'll be able to go GE site by site and say, okay, well, this, because this is happening here, it must be happening everywhere. There will be some overarching guiding principles, again, built on around health and safety and customer needs and considerations that will drive those individual site considerations, as will the local, state, federal regulations as well. Right. So, uh, but that work is underway. Uh, as a matter of fact, yeah. For I'm, I'm head of our office in DC, and I've got one of my team members who's leading that internal analysis and right. is going to put, put forward recommendations for how we think about reopening or bringing the workforce back into the DC site. Great. Um, well, that was one question I had. And then you touched on communication, but have you had to tap into any other different strengths during this time? And did you develop any of those skills in law school? <laughs> um, you know, the, the most important skill that I rely upon from law school, um, you know, so I, you know, it's, it's the basic, right? Critical reasoning, critical thinking, right? Because it's a, yeah. you know, that's why I tell people all the time, you know, even if you don't want to be a lawyer, law school might be worth the pursuit because you're really going to sharpen your critical reasoning and thinking and communication skills, right? Those are the things that are bread and butter to the profession. And so, you know, I've been relying on those quite a bit. In unprecedented times, I think that's what you fall back on, right? And so in this environment, we've been presented with tons of information and data that all has to be processed, has to be considered in the context of what are our, what are our priorities? How do we you know, attend to the health and safety of our people? And then you know, you've got that, you know, how do you build, you know, take all that data, which is, off, which is sometimes in conflict, and come up with the right policies and practices that uh, make the most sense for everyone involved. So um, been leaning on that quite a bit, uh, been working closely with our businesses. You know, the nature of this 
uh, virus and the pandemic and it's, it's, you know, tremendously terrible impact on the economy yes. has caused a lot of businesses to sort of rethink whatever your plans were coming into 2020, right? You've had to Shake maybe throw out, throw out the script a little bit. Uh, and so being part of those conversations and having to retool, reassess on the fly, you know, keeping the, the main priorities uh, static if you can, but understanding that, you know, the ground shifted, right? And so for the, you know, look, we, we have an aviation business, as everyone knows, we sell commercial and military aircraft. The commercial, commercial air travel is down 95, 97% um, from year over year. And so it's had a tremendous effect. So we have to rethink that business and, you know, and how do we manage that business? On the other side of the equation, you know, you have a healthcare business where one of the products we manufacture are ventilators, right? And so oh, all wow. of a sudden, you yeah. know, we've had double production in that <laughs> business and are contemplating doubling it again, right? Just because of, and so, and then dealing with regulators, policymakers on all those issues, right? Yeah. Just talking to the US government about, the aviation sector, which is one of the major exporters uh, for the U.S., talking to the policymakers about the availability and production of ventilators and monitors and other critically needed equipment. So, um, you know, we we're, we're all retooling on the fly. So, so dexterity, flexibility, and critical thinking and reasoning are are important here. So, was your time as U.S. senator do you, was that really valuable to what you're doing now in terms of being able to figure out what the next steps are um, and talking to government leaders? And um, are you using those types of skills every day now as we respond to this really fast-moving, um, you know, 2020? I've never seen things shift hourly, daily updates, updates from our governor daily. Yeah. Um, the president daily for a while, but was that time absolutely key for what you're doing now and being able to understand how all this process? Um, well, it certainly was helpful. I can't say it hurt, right? But, I, <laughs> but I'd also like to say that the totality of my sort of career experiences have, have best positioned me for these moments. You know, look, being in Congress to see how the committee process worked, to see how bills work is certainly helpful, particularly in what I'll call normal times. These are not normal times though, right? right. So, you know, the last time Congress has had to act as they are acting now in terms of, of uh, the speed and, and the need to really put together rapidly some significant aid stimulus programs was coming out of the financial crisis, right? And so yeah. unfortunately, you know, that was, we've got to get out of this habit of this happening every 10, 12 years, but nonetheless, you know, I would say to you, the people who were in Congress back in the financial crisis are the people who probably have the best insight as to what's happening now, what needs to happen. But I will say during my time there, my short time there, it was informative, instructive to see how um, from up close, from inside, how, you know, the processes that give rise to legislation and policy. Um, and also, frankly, to understand the personalities who are in the room. And while there's been a fair amount of turnover in the Congress since 2013, there's still a fair number of people, particularly the senior most people uh, who were around then and the ability to, uh, you know, I've maintained relationships with a fair number of those and the ability to right. reach out and oftentimes just to get information or share perspective, uh, less asking for something, right? But right. sometimes uh, that's the most important thing. And so those relationships are, remain incredibly valuable. Um, and you know, it's, 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 I guess I did acquire the ability to what I'll call interpret some of the statements and actions that tend to come out of Congress or come out of DC. So that is a useful tool to have, uh, for our business leaders, uh, who sometimes as most people do these days, look at Congress and say, well, what are they thinking? What are they saying? What does this all mean? You know, and part of our job is to help, uh, decipher that. Do you uh, personally have a kitchen cabinet of people that you call on that um, perhaps are mentors that um, could help you through a difficult time like this, unprecedented, very unusual? Um, do you have people that you still call on? Oh, for heaven's sake, absolutely. Like al almost daily, you know, I, you know, mentors are great 
And I have some fabulous mentors who I've known for a long time, known me for a long, long time. I'm always in the market for new mentors. <laughs> it's like, I don't <laughs> think you can ever, ever get enough. Um, but I, you know, I do have kitchen cabinets, some people who are family members, you know, right. um, live under the same roof, if you will. Yeah. Others who are friends I've known or come to know over the span of my career. Uh, obviously, folks like Duvall continues to be a great friend and mentor to me. Roderick Ireland, who's, who's former Chief Justice SJC and now teaches at Northeastern, is a mentor. Folks from my days at Duke, yep. uh, folks, folks back in uh, back in the Yadkinville area, right? And so I don't talk to everybody all the time, but good mentors are available when you need them and offer and are willing to give good advice. Good mentees are willing to ask for it. And so I, I do my part uh, to try to ask for the advice. I tell my team members all the time, one of the most empowering things that you can do is, you know, ask somebody for assistance, perspective, or guidance, right? I think good leaders are people who aren't afraid to acknowledge what they don't know or, or uh, just acknowledge that they don't have the answers to every question. And I think uh, that makes you a better leader. It also empowers your team or gives them confidence uh, particularly when they're the one to help you sort of finish framing the question, framing the issue. Um, so absolutely. I lean heavily on a lot of people for that. That's, that's reassuring. It's just reassuring because we, you know, we all feel like we need to do that at times, but it's good to know that you are as well. Um, I, my next question is, what do you predict the lasting effect of the pandemic will be on the way mm. we work? And how do you think it will impact um, the practice of law? Um, look, I, I think we're already experiencing the impact in the way we work. The fact that uh, we're all communicating through this medium at the moment. I think what many companies or institutions have discovered the last couple of months that working from home for many of their employees or team members is, is, is not nearly as or fundamentally as disruptive as some may have thought. We've all discovered that perhaps we don't all need to be in the same space all the time to be efficient, to be productive. Uh, and look, you know, the work for home situation, uh, assuming, you know, people have resources, access to technology uh, can can be a useful, you know, look, as you know, in most major cities now, right? The public transportation, the roadways are, are yeah. more open and cleaner. We're seeing the, the benefits of that. So I, I think the way we work certainly is going to be impacted. And I, I think many of companies are probably going to tell their workforce, listen, we have a plan for you to return, but you don't necessarily have to return, right? Because we now know that you can be productive. Uh, I do worry about the impact on travel, business travel um, yes. for us and others. Um, this has become a necessary, but it may become the preferred medium. And so that has impact on the aviation sector, which obviously matters a great deal to us. Um, but the one thing I do worry about this work for home environment, uh, Miel, is that, you know, I think along the way, too many of us have lost uh, the sense of boundaries. What is work time and what is what is downtime? Yeah. Because we're, we're in the same environment all the time and too much of the work is bleeding into the personal. We have to remember to get up from these desks, get off these Zoom calls, actually to your earlier question, go and spend time with the other people in your house. Yeah. Uh, go out, take a walk if you can, wear a mask. Um, and so I think that's one thing we all have to be attentive to. I think this will be an interesting challenge, but opportunity for HR leaders and others to sort of rethink and possibly reframe, you know, what it means, what the, what the work environment actually is or means as we go forward. So. Um. I, I agree. I'm not anxious to get on my commuter rail or an airplane anytime soon. I'm just not. Um, I would always come away with the flu on a good day on an airplane. Um, We're going to get you back on a plane, Mia. We're going to get you back on a plane. You are. I do <laughs> like to, I do like to travel. Um, yeah. So I, I hope it changes and we get a vaccine, et cetera. I personally have felt like Governor Baker has done a really good job with our state. I'm wondering if you want to speak to that for a moment. Yeah, listen, I give uh, Governor Baker and his team credit. Um, you know, I, I think the governors, if you look across the country, you know, it, you know, it's often been said, you know, states are the laboratories of democracy. And in moments of crisis, 
governors and mayors are closest to the action, right? Uh, they're closest to the constituencies and really most of the policies that are driving both, uh, if you will, the shutdown and the reopen have to come from the governors, right? It's yep. really a more of a state, less a federal issue. And here in Massachusetts um, or in neighboring states like what you've seen with Governor Cuomo or in Connecticut, and there's a long list all across the country. I think many of the, uh, most of the governors have done a fantastic job in trying to balance all the equities. And Governor Baker here, and I think his team have done a great job, particularly on the communication, right? And I think it's important to communicate what you know and what you don't know, right? right. And everybody would like all of our leaders to know everything, but I think it's very powerful for a leader to say, there are things we don't know, but we're still gonna need to try to account for them. And I also give him credit because he pulled together this uh, task force of business leaders to think about reopening our economy, right? And so, you know, Governor Baker's always been a data-driven guy. And I think it's been, I've been impressed at how he's gone out to get the kind of data that we need to make the kind of decisions that lie ahead for us. And that's, that's what you look for in a public leader. That's what we, we, we want in our public leaders. And I think in moments like this, you know, uh, many, uh, as they should, turn to our elected leaders and say, what's our path forward? And uh, standing up there, communicating, uh, again, sharing what you do know and what you don't know, and emphasizing at every turn, health safety, I think is key. So kudos to, to, to our yeah. leaders for doing that. Absolutely, transparency I think is essential and he's done a good job at that. Um, a last little note from you, any other lessons in leadership that you've taken away from this current time and that you wanna share with us? Uh, how about this? Look, you know, for those who are in leadership positions and that's virtually all of us, perhaps in either our professional or personal lives, just remember that somebody's looking up to you, looking to you, at, uh, particularly in moments like this that are, where there's so much uncertainty um, and seeming chaos, and maybe even fear, right? There's so much we don't know. No. You got to acknowledge that. Uh, communicate with your folks. Uh, try to be transparent about what you do and what you don't know and what the impacts and effects may be. But, you know, on your list of priorities or list of, of things you think matter right now, just appreciate that empathy matters. People are scared, they're hurt, they're uncertain. Acknowledge that, uh, check in with your team members. I start every call with my teams asking how everyone's doing um, and don't let them get away with just sort of the standard, oh, everything's good, you know, probe a little bit. People yeah. need to know that we actually care about them right now, right? We're dealing with this significant health issue, but if you're in leadership, yeah, your responsibility is to manage the situation, but your job is to lead people. And those people matter and they have feelings and they care and they're concerned. So and if you don't know your people, if you're not connecting with your people, if you're not showing empathy for your people, you know, um, it makes them, it amplifies their anxiety about too many things, so many things. So make that connection, be empathetic. Uh, and by the way, show your own, you know, to be a leader isn't isn't a mandate that you you appear mm -hmm. like invincible or, or invulnerable. Show your own vulnerabilities. Share those as well, um, because I love that. You know, you're you're part of the team as well. Absolutely. Well, I think we're going to end on that note. Mo, thank you for being here. Please give my best to Stacy, your boys. I, I wish you continued good health. And um, I thank you for sharing your leadership thoughts with our audience today. And it's just nice to spend time with you. It's always reassuring for me to get a little mo time. So wishing <laughs> you the best, wishing you the best. Enjoy talking to you. And thank you. Thanks for spending thanks, time. Thanks, Miel. Yeah. Thanks for Good. having me. And thanks everybody for listening. Stay safe, stay healthy, hug a loved one, including your pets. Take care. Love that. Take care, Mo. <laughs> Bye.